You can unmute yourself, Sandy. We're ready to go. Prof, I think you're muted. Hi, sorry about that. We we're having some a little technical hitch, sort of uh, unmuting there. Forgive me. Um, anyway, welcome today. Um, this is today's um, G Echo. It's a endoscopy. Um, G Echo today, and um, I'd like to just thank the Gastro Foundation and Project Echo from University of New Mexico for putting together the hosting of this, and we're obviously running this from the India Hub. This is a Wednesday session, um, and it's weekly, and uh, next week I'm sure there will be further um, parts of the program. I'm not quite sure what's coming up next, but at the end, I will let you know. Anyway, um, we changed gears from the colon and uh, how to prepare the colon last week, which I'm sure was uh, interesting, but perhaps not as interesting as today's talk is going to be. And um, today we've got uh, uh, Galia Chinnery, and she's going to talk to us about duodenal stenting. She uh, has an interest in stenting various GI organs um, and has published uh, quite extensively on it and recently has um, submitted a, a manuscript on it uh, regarding her experience with exactly this topic. And I'm sure this is going to be practical and valuable. And uh, please remember to post your questions in the uh, chat box and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully have some fruitful discussion um, at the end of our session. Galia, over to you. Thanks, Prof. So um, I would very much like to keep it practical. I think that's sort of the way we need to go. Um, and that's what I think I can hopefully give you today. Um, just can someone confirm you can see my screen? We can indeed. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So um, to get us started off, um, I thought just a very brief overview, and I think it's all very good and well accepting someone for a duodenal stent on your list. Um, it's often that we get excited by that and forget the complete contraindications. So remember, it seems so simple when you talk about it, but don't forget to look for a distal small bowel obstruction perforation. And then remember also to give your patients quite realistic expectations of their stenting specifically in the situation of impaired gastric motility. And by far the most common thing that presents to us is the really unfortunate diffuse type gastric cancers that present with that rather nasty linitis plastica type of infiltration where, you know, it doesn't matter if you have a dominant stricture that you're able to um, unblock, you just have an absolutely useless stomach as regards motility. And they have very little, unfortunately, improvement after your stenting. There are some yeah, relative contraindications, being specifically whether there is distal peritoneal carcinomatosis. I would still go for it. I think that's, that's relative. Um, and then just to remember two important things, I think we're all aware that short -come outcomes are very good with stenting. But if you have a patient that has a longer life expectancy, um, quality of life and longer outcomes are definitely better with a gastrojejunostomy. So I do think it's worthwhile to look at your individual patient coming through. I just thought for interest's sake, um, these, I think I can't remember the last two years or whatever, our duodenal stents, just to show you what pathology we deal with for the majority. So that's three quarters of our patients are actually gastric malignancies. And then um, our 15% or so actually pancreatic. Now, if you go and look at papers coming from Europe and so forth, that um, is com completely different, where the majority of their obstructions um, of the upper GI tract on the stomach side are pancreatic in origin. So just to show you that the pathology is, is considerably different um, down south. So I'm showing you here a 
video quite obviously of an obstructed stomach. Um, and I think the thing about the duodenal stents is that they are without a doubt a little bit more challenging than an esophageal stent. Just finding where you think the lumen might be is sometimes a bit of a mission. Um, and my only trick, I'll show you a little bit why I say so, but the trick is to aim as if you were aiming for your normal pylorus. Don't get um, distracted by the tumor bulk or where you think the lumen is. Just let your scope be guided along the greater curve as always. And you should end up in the general direction of the lumen. The other important sort of study to, to, to take note of is the SUSTENT trial uh, study, which was a randomized group of patients um, with gastric outlet obstruction, either to a surgical gastrojege or a stent. And this is basically what is supporting what I said in the first slide, that if you think your patient's life expectancy is more than two months and that patient is surgically fit, don't just pop in a duodenal stent because you can. Um, that patient may very well benefit from a gastrojege. Obviously, they've concluded as well, if your life expectancy is less, by all means, continue with your stent. Um, there are three factors which will make you lean towards a stent placement, specifically poor nutritional status, which is quite common in this group, and then ascites, and generally overall a poor functional status. Makes sense. So that should come for a stent as well. Now, um, the one addition to... this is um, pathology. We've said gastrojege and um, e uh, endoscopic stenting are safe and effective for malignant goo, um, but the difference is again with pancreatic. So there's, there's better outcomes when it's a gastric obstruction, and we're going to talk about that just now. I'm going to show you practically why I think that is so. The other thing to just bear in mind, every time you do put in a, in a duodenal stent, um, discuss with the patient and the family that there is quite a high chance of a re-intervention at some point in the future. So up to 20%, if you look at those two studies um, from the one from 2020, the other 2018. So that, that's quite a lot. And I do think we should be on the lookout for people that need a re-intervention. So let's get to the practical things. Um, duodenal stents, absolutely, you shouldn't even start this if you do not have a functioning suction unit, not on your scope, but next to the patient's face with a Yankawa on it. Um, we all know that this is a high-risk procedure due to aspiration, but every now and then we've started this and someone's forgotten to, to connect the, the suction, um, which is quite a disaster if they do um, vomit, which you, as you know, and with all this obstruction is quite a is quite a common thing. The other thing I would like to say is don't be tempted to suck up all the fluid. There's always something chunky in it. Um, you'll block the scope. So try and stay above your puddle. Don't aspirate the stomach to dryness. What you should do is not insufflate until the stomach is so discomforting to the patient that they vomit. So as little insufflation as possible, but don't be tempted to feel you must aspirate that puddle up. Um, the other thing I've done every now and then, which makes me want to kick myself, is sometimes to start a um, duodenal stent and forget that I actually need a large channel scope. You all know by now that a um, standard gastroscope will not allow the duodenal device, duodenal stent device through the channel. So just check always that you've got the right scope. Um, my big problem is always when the obstruction is fairly chronic, you struggle actually to get to the level of this obstruction if it's very distal, you run out of scope length. And we'll talk about that just now. Then, as I mentioned, the other two things is where is the jolly lumen? Um, I always say cobra, um, but I'm going to show you just now a, a video of a fluoroscopic image of how your scope actually moves forward. And it's quite surprising to me always, even in a normal stomach, how much length you actually need. Um, and the tip honestly looks like a little cobra and you're, and you're popped through into the duodenum. That's the one thing. So I'll just show you that so you can appreciate if the stomach is even bigger, why you struggle. 
jag wire um, that's my favorite wire to use it's beautiful and soft and safe in my opinion um, and the fact that it's got stripes on it super useful as in as in the situation with ERCPs if the stripes are moving your guide wire is going somewhere either out or in um, and you need a really astute endoscopy sister with you or assistant that's quite aware of what she's doing or he's doing um, and that stripiness on the endoscopic picture is to me very useful if that's moving. And then we're going to discuss a little bit what stent should we be using um, and the benefits obviously of covered, uncovered and partially covered. So yeah, here's a picture off the internet, not one of my pictures, but of a very distended long term and one can imagine gastric outlet obstruction. Um, and you can see that the gastric um, greater curvature is hanging right down there in the um, pelvis. This is a picture of, sorry for the image quality, but just to show you, this is a tube, um, a nasogeginal tube that we've put down for preoperative feeding in a, person, in a patient with a distal resectable gastric outlet obstruction from a, from a gastric CA. And just what, what's there, it's even further down, the greater curvature is tickling the bladder. So just to appreciate that if you're really running out of scope of the stomach is not useful in this situation. Um, so we used to have the, we used to have a jumbo scope, which had a fantastically huge biopsy channel We've lost access to that, and now we are using a colonoscopy, a colonoscope, to do our duodenal stents, and that length is quite beneficial. The jumbo scope is jolly short, so now we've got the added advantage of the length of a C-scope, although the maneuverability of the tip um, leaves much to be desired in a G-scope setting, but you can see why you're going to need length here. So this is just a, it's a little bit higgly piggly, but here, please look, um, you'll see, a, this is a normal scope. Um, and you'll see the scope, this is also an absolutely unpathological stomach coming down. And you'll see as you start aiming towards the pylorus, the scope tends to bump along the greater curvature. And to me, it's always quite impressive just how much length you need to push in. There we're hitting the pylorus, and now we've actually gone around the duodenum. And you can see a puff of air actually shooting down the jejunum. It'll, I've, I've looped it, so you can see it again. But just look at the curvature going through to D2. It's so small. I, I'm always amazed about how small that is. Um, and that your, your length lying along the greater curvature is so huge. Now, this stomach is situated at the umbilicus or so. Um, but if that, you know, let me replay that um, just to show you again. There we go. So I'm going through a bit further. Okay, so there's that length that we're talking about. And now you're at the pylorus. And you're peeping through to D1. There the air shoots down to the, uh, to the jejunum. So you know you've come through and are blasting air down that. Um, but again, it's that, that to me is always quite an impressive image. You don't appreciate this when you're doing the scope. Okay, enough of that. So what about stents? What do we have? We all know we've got covered stents, which have the benefit of less tumor ingrowth and as such less stent obstruction. Um, but on the, on the negative side, there's a much increased rate of stent migration. There's uncovered stents available to us, less migration, obviously, as the, as the mucosa grows through that sort of chicken wire, um, the little holes of your stent. But on the flip side, you're going to get more blockage. So a little bit of thought should go into what you're stenting with for what pathology. Um, the issue with the duodenal stent is quite simply the anatomy. Your head of pancreas is quite stiff, yet you've got this powerful gastric um, contractions coming from proximally. So if you have a um, covered stent, the ch chances of that migrating is very high. Now we've got some unpublished data where our we had a, a series of patients we put in covered stents for various reasons, but our migration rate was up to was almost at sixty percent. 
So that's incredibly high. Um, and the complications can be that your stent gets stuck distally and causes a perforation or an obstruction. So it's not something you, you should um, view very lightly. It's sometimes amazing, though, that the stents come all the way out. We've had one gentleman arrive with his esophageal stent that came out um, the back end. So, yeah, the stents do pass, but just to be in, in with, don't forget your anatomy. So that C curve, you do want something that um, has flexibility around that, around that curve, but I'll show you now why that's not always such a good idea. The second thing, very important, where in the duodenum are you stenting? So the more proximal, the definitely the more easier the situation in that the bottom, the bottom line is you need to get your stents top flange hanging through the pyloric channel into the antrum. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the ampulla and so forth. The distal duodenal stentings are by far the more difficult ones. D2, D3, um, still reasonable, but when you get more distal than that, mm, um, I really do have situations where I struggle and often fail if it's a D3 or D4. Stents are not the same. Um, just for an example here, here are two stents, the wall stent and the, oh, what's the other one called? I can't remember the, anyway, it doesn't matter. Two different stents, same company. Look at that, just, that, just want to show you that. The expansion force, very different between the two stents. Compression force, very different. Um, and the reason I put this up here, you need to be aware of where you are stenting with a very stiff, um, big axial force um, kind of stent. For example, if you are putting in an esophageal stent in a younger person, um, that radial or axial force um, up in the tracheal region can be quite problematic and you can end up with a fistula. Um, now the same thing distally, you really have to be careful of what you're stenting where and be aware of which of your stents are more gentle, if I can put it that way as regards your axial force, or which is something that's really going to open it up. What they say makes the difference is whether you have um, a more, I don't know if you can see that, more a more of a hook type um, mesh work to your stent that is supposed to offer more flexibility, which as we saw just now with that C loop, I think the more flexible your stent in this situation, the better. However, the more flexible you make it, the less axial strength you've potentially got. So um, that's one thing to consider. Then the, the cross wiring technique where they, where they actually just cross, um, that offers much more stability in getting through your, your um, deployment device through a stricture. So you almost want a bit of everything if you can. Um, but certain situations will, will lend themselves best to a specific stent. Um, the knitted stent, so that's the one where we said is hooked, you call it a knitted or a hooked. Um, they are good for uh, flexibility, as we said, which you can see here would be great around the C loop, but they lose some of that axial tension. Um, We'll speak a little bit more about that later. The other thing is that your, your agent coming to sell you the stent might try and influence you as regards their stent is better. Looking at the cell size, this is smaller, this is bigger, whatever. There's quite a lot of information about cell size. It does not influence in growth. So that's something you can pretty much disregard. Um, and you know them telling you less in growth with a certain cell size, that's rubbish. That's not true. So let's quickly talk about the actual process of popping in your duodenal stent. Um, for me, there's four main steps. Quite simply, you've got to get your guide wire through your obstruction, quite obviously. Um, I've drawn it in yellow because most of the JAG wires are yellow. Um, so the first step is to get your um, room kitted with both a fluoroscopic view and an endoscopic view. I do think you can get away with esophageal stents um, without fluoroscopy on occasion, but I think that's tricky with duodenal stenting. So you do need fluoroscopy. So first thing, get your guide wire through. When you think you've come around the C loop, um, we put down what we call a coaxial, which essentially for those of you not familiar is just an empty tubing. 
that you're able to feed down your biopsy channel over your guide wire, like a CVP. Then you pull out your guide wire, leaving that um, empty tubing, your coaxial behind. And through that, you can then inject contrast for two reasons. You want to, one, confirm that you've gotten, gotten distally to the obstruction. And you can see I've tried to draw that you sort of putting contrast in there. Um, and then the second thing is obviously to confirm that you're intraluminal because um, tumors and specific strictures are friable and you know every now and then you will perforate and push your guide wire through into the wrong spot. So I'm, I'm quite keen on everybody confirming fluoroscopically with contrast that you're in the lumen before you do anything else. Then you put your guide wire back through your coaxial and you retract your coaxial, leaving just your guide wire behind. And then your delivery device with a stent on passes over your guide wire and through your stricture. I tend to push my entire, guide, my entire delivery device with a stent right through the stricture. And I'll show you just now why. Um, but the, the idea is that I place my stent after I've deployed the whole thing, not deployed, after I've pushed the whole delivery device out of the scope, in that it's quite easy to pull a stent towards you. But once you've opened it and you suddenly realize, gosh, I'm actually too proximal, remember that these stents all deploy distally. You can't actually push your stent further down again. So it makes more sense to me to be um, aware of that, push it all the way, and then pull it towards you. And the other reason for doing that is if you are very close with your with the face of your scope, right on the obstruction almost, you've got a lot of stability with your scope. And that, that stiff deployment device gets through that stricture much, much easier than if you're standing a little bit further away with your scope. Then the stiff deployment device, the force of it trying to get through actually pushes your scope away and you get the whole thing flopping out into your and um, through into your antrum, which is a mess. Then you've got to start all over again. So um, just the same images color, color, colorating at the bottom. Um, here a video. Trying to show exactly all of that. So going down um, and you can see normal movements to, to aid yourself towards the pylorus, not looking for anything. Just guide the scope as you always would. And invariably, it kind of puts you in that area where the stent, uh, where the um, stricture is. So that's quite a nice one. It's still quite open. Um, here you see the scope version, the fluoros fluoroscopic version of the same situation. And you can see there that the stricture is going to be sitting very close to my face. So I've got the scope right there. The guide wire has gone through. And um, for those of you that have not seen this, watch the guide wire as it moves, you'll see the stripes moving. And I hope the little image on the other side is quite small, but what you can hopefully see is the first marker of the stent passing through. And you can see the guide wires of the stent. Again, notice how close my scope is to the stricture. I don't want to be far away. Then that um, entire device gets kicked back. You see there on the endoscopic view now, the yellow tip, which signifies this is the end of the scope. And now your assistant starts deploying. Remember, it deploys distally. You need to, as the endoscopist, keep pulling back. You are the one that positions that stent. Um, you don't want a huge length of stent out in the stomach, but you do want an extra couple of centimeters in that the more you've got out, you sort of get a flap valve effect. So you want two, three centimeters. I think to be very critical here, I could have pulled back that stent a little bit further. And then it's quite nice um, to go right into where you see the stricture and put contrast through. And it's quite satisfying to see on the fluoroscopic imaging there that you've got, conf excuse me, that you've got confirmation that there's now flow through. That stent should um, expand within a couple of hours. And if by 24 hours you see no difference, that stent won't expand further. Um, and we'll get to that shortly. Here is just not as nice a picture, but it's perhaps a bit clearer where we've got the coaxial, the little tubing through the stricture. And we're just confirming our positioning with the contrast going through it. I, I really feel quite strongly that one should do that, um, even when you think it's a really easy duodenal stent.
Um, and here, I hope that's, that you can see there's a long, again, my stretches here. I'm at the C loop coming around here. And I've got a whole herd of loops of, of guide wire, probably too much, but um, always have a bit more guide wire than you need. And there you can see us pushing the entire stent out through the um, stricture and then pulling it back such that it deploys quite, it deploys much easier if the endoscopist is, is controlling it by pulling it back into position rather than trying to push it forward. It just doesn't work. Um, and that's, yeah, that's quite a reasonable positioning there. Then um, I think it's important to be aware of what type of scenarios can predict a failure of a stent. You can get in a beautiful stent, pat yourself on the back that this was a great technical success. Um, but when you actually review the patient, there's been zero improvement as regards quality of life. And I do think it's important to know a couple of those factors. So this was a nice um, article that put together from last year. A nice article that put together quite a few studies as regards duodenal stents. Um, and the one key thing that popped up is um, be realistic who you're stenting in that if you have a really bad performance status, you are not going to have a good um, outcome. So if you've got an ECOG 3 or 4, um, you know, you, you're potentially not going to win this as regards quality of life. So I'm not saying don't stent the patient. Um, but I do think the family need to be quite aware that you might not actually see much improvement if it's a very poor performance status. The other thing um, which I alluded to earlier, if the stomach is, is basically the gastric motility, or, or if your stomach cannot contract and empty itself, your stent's not going to help. Um, and that's usually with diffuse distal motility issues or multiple level obstructions it's not going to improve in any way. So it's either with the peritoneal dissemination kind of picture. Um, but as I said earlier, in our setup, it's usually the patients that come with that dreadful linitis plastica type of infiltration, where you might still have a distal dominant stricture. And you might kid yourself and say, oh, let me pop in a stent here. Um, I'm going to make a big improvement here. You won't, because that stomach that lies proximally cannot empty even though there's now a distal opening up of that stricture. So they have a very poor outcome. And I think, yeah, be very realistic when you're explaining this procedure to your patients. I think in some cases where you've got a stricture and you can still get your scope through, I don't think you're doing any good by adding the stent there. You're not going to improve anything. The other thing is the position of your obstruction. So the level of obstruction becomes more tricky as you progress down the, the length of the duodenum. Um, distal duodenal lesions around the ligament of trites are the absolute worst. Um, and I think, you know, a third, if not a half of half of the patients that come, fortunately not often, but when they come, um, I don't actually manage. It's really tricky getting that very, the guide wire usually goes, but getting the stiff um, deployment device of a duodenal stent around that quite acute angle um, doesn't always work. And then the other thing is, I do sometimes wonder if you're stenting something that's sitting so close with tumor and everything, um, is that the last bit of compression that might just squish off your um, artery in that area? So mm, tricky one. The other thing, we've mentioned linitis plastica, but here I also agree with this, and this I've come across not infrequently. When you have a gallbladder cancer that's giving you a gastric outlet obstruction, they've got considerable extrinsic bulk with pressure on it and very often a really poor outcome after a stent. And to me, the reason is that you've got this massive liver that's got the tumor of the gallbladder stuck on it. And, and you're kidding yourself if your tiny little stent is gonna be able to push that whole liver out the way. Um, I'll show you later an image of a very nicely placed stent for a gallbladder mass, but the axial expansion force is just no match for that tumor pressure. So in this situation, gallbladder cancer, I think it's worth a try, but I wouldn't be disappointed if that stent, or no, let me rephrase that, I wouldn't be surprised if that stent doesn't um, do much, and you may be forced to do a gastrojej or an endoscopic um, gastrojej. 
The other thing um, which will predict a poor clinical outcome is poor stent expansion at insertion. So once you've popped your stent in and you notice that the, that the expansion um, axially or radially at the level of your stretcher is, is less than 30% of that stent diameter, there's a very good chance that your stent will not expand enough to offer any clinical improvement. So I think those are just a couple of things to be aware of. Um, that might be a great technical outcome, but you're not going to have a good clinical outcome. A quick word for D2, head of pancreas obstructions. As you know, this is the second most common gr commonest group that we see for malignant obstructions. And the failure is often due to poor stent positioning from the word go. Um, here, I've tried to draw it, it's not so nice, but try and, try and imagine it, if you will, that if you put your stent such that the stricture at D2 is beautifully in the middle of your stent, and you've got a fairly short stent, your um, expansion and radial forces naturally, if you, the stents that we have anyway, they tend to straighten out that stent. Um, and your stent is stronger than a duodenal wall, and it'll straighten out longitudinally. And the result is that the opening of the stent sits closing off, having the mu mucosa close off there. Um, and you're basically sitting with content and stuff hitting the side, um, and you've not improved the drainage of that system very much. So for duodenal stents, I invariably of the D2 region, let me rephrase that, I will always use a long stent that, that protrudes out with the flange into the antrum just through the pyloric channel. So that even when it does um, try and straighten up a bit, you've got still the, the um, longitudinal axis such that it's going to drain. So it's not worthwhile using a short stent, in my opinion, for a D2 obstruction. It is very different. However, if you've got a further, if you've got a more distal obstruction, then of course it doesn't matter if the opening is sitting is sitting at D2. You're still going to have a beautiful longitudinal drainage um, axis of drainage. So it depends. Look very much as to where your flange will open once it straightens. I think that's worthwhile to consider, especially the D2 ones. Oopsie. Um, then everyone always asks, what about biliary obstruction pancreatitis? It's reported um, by these um, authors as being up to 18%. Mm, I'm going to be very honest. I don't think we actively look for it in that I've not yet had a D2 stent come back with pancreatitis. And... Um, Maybe we overlook it and say it's stent expansion pain if they complain with abdominal pain, but I don't think we actively ever go and check the amylase. Um, and if it's obstructed, well, you kind of blame it on the tumor anyway. It's, of course, very different if you've got simultaneously a biliary stent in situ. That's very different. Then you shouldn't really obstruct. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I'm going to be honest, we've not had that come back to us. But again, perhaps we're not looking for it. Um, I do think, though, if your, if your obstruction is sitting in the pyloric channel D1 and you've used a slightly longer stent and you think it's bobbing in the wind close to your ampulla, that um, D2 isn't obstructed, it isn't stiff, it contracts normally, and it shouldn't seal over your duodenal stent. It's wider than that. So then I don't think it's an issue. It's more of an issue when there's um, a stiff duodenum that, that seals off. So I don't think it's normally a problem with a, with a distal gastric stenting. Um, here, just for interest, what did they, these same authors, um, they look for risk factors, which now specifically were related to this 18% of people coming with, with pancreatitis post duodenal stenting. And the three factors that were significant were significant were female sex, absence of biliary stents, which that makes sense, um, and obviously also making sense with a stiff D2 region is if there's tumor invasion into the papilla. So those were the three sort of predictive areas, ugh, predictors um, of biliary obstruction and or pancreatitis. I'm not quite sure why female, that doesn't make sense to me, but the other two do. Okay, so now um, we've chatted a bit about pathology, obstruction level, 
what about the specific situation where there's a fistula or perforation? I thought we could mention that. Um, and here, obviously, your, your aim is different. Um, you are trying to seal off your duodenum. Um, and a, a cupboard stent is then naturally the choice to go with. The stents that we've always used are fully covered. Um, I, to be honest, we've never really had a partially covered duodenal stent. They do exist. Um, they're easier to get hold of as regards the esophageal stenting side. But for the duodenal ones, we've generally got fully covered stents. And as we've chatted about there, the problem there is migration. But just here, he has a one-shot abdominal view of a stomach. Um, and you can see a perk drain. There's a drainage bag on the patient's belly and a complete um, fistula. Everything's going out into that bag. This was a gunshot abdomen of a D1, D2 area injury. Um, and I think about two weeks out and nobody was that keen to go back for a surgical relook. So here we placed a fully covered stent. Um, and you can see that's that's beautiful. I mean, it's completely sealed off. Everything's going distally. There's no need for the drain anymore. Um, and this patient did fantastically well, got discharged. And then our plan was to remove the stent in two or three weeks time. And when he came back, that's the image, nice and healed. There's no fistula. There's no obvious stricture. We could get through nicely with the scope going distally, but obviously, um, there is now confirmation of migration of our fully covered stent. So um, this is one of our 60% that migrated, did the job, but how do you retrieve that? Or you just wait and see. So for this one, we waited and just let it come out, fortunately. But the question then is, how do you try and prevent migration of covered stents? Because when you do need a covered stent, you really do want it not to move. Um, for malignant gastric outlet obstruction, the potential benefit of using a covered stent would be, of course, to have a slightly less high, a, a less, less of a chance of a tumor ingrowth and subsequent reblockage. Um, but the migration rate is quite high, um, up to a third of patients in this study. And I think you'll agree that the chance of a complication with a migrating stent in a palliative gastric cancer um, with potential distal carcinomatosis and, and adherent bowel where there isn't much mobility, things will get stuck and they'll perforate. So that's just a potentially nasty end. So um, in malignant disease, we always use an uncovered, as we said before, and if they outlive our covered, uncovered stent and come back with, a, with an obstruction, we re-stent them through the old stent. You can't remove it. It's completely ingrown, um, but you put your guide wire through the old stent and you just place it absolutely in the same place. Um, works pretty well most of the time, and we've got good success in getting the second, sometimes even the third or fourth stent through. Benign stents. Um, let's talk about that. Benign goo. Um, when you've got someone, for whatever reason, you want to close a fistula, like in the previous example, or you have a benign stricture that you want to stretch up for whatever reason, you don't think it's safe to dilate. Yes, you can do it. But as I said to you, our migration was super, our migration rate was super high. So my first, my first attempt to try and keep the jolly things in place was to put hemoclips on. Thought I was very clever, looked great, but let's be honest. Within a day or two, the the concentric um, contractions of your distal stomach, being as strong as they are, will just pull that tiny mucosal clip right off. Then I thought I was even cleverer, and I put two clips, one on opposite side. And that was just an absolute waste of money. They just pop off simultaneously. Then I thought, okay, fair enough. So what about putting two or three on the one side? So we started doing that. And the problem with the hemoclipses is that they are just not taking deep enough bites. Um, that mucosa and the clip just tear off after a while. So then we tried using um, Ovesco clips. And unfortunately, somebody else beat us to it and actually wrote it up. But that's what it looks like. You put the um, flange of your... Um, stent, you, and this one's a partially covered, but be it covered or uncovered, uh, covered or partially covered, um, lying such that you're able to put a nice big Ovesco clip onto the side of the flange 
holding a nice big bite of, of the mucosa plus the muscle underneath. Now the next, I'm sorry for the rubbish image, but, but I do hope you can see, this is a lady, um, you can see this gas here, retroperitoneal air. I hope that, I hope that you can see that. Um, this is a lady where I was trying to be a little bit brave, I think, a bit stupid probably, in that she had a D1 stricture. Now, D1 and a pyloric, pyloric channel stricture is two very different things. You can be quite aggressive with a pyloric channel stricture. They, they're quite tough. There's a lot of muscle bulk there. Diameter-wise, you can go up a bit. But what I did was dilate a D1 stricture with a 15 millimeter balloon right straight up front, which was a very stupid thing to do. Um, obviously too much and I perforated. I knew immediately I had perforated. I could see it under fluoroscopy. Um, so I wanted to cover that hole and I don't know if you can see, um, but try and imagine here's the stent. There's some contrast there, but there's the stent in the pyloric channel. Um, and there I've put that Ovesco clip um, holding things in place, hopefully. Just for, the, for those of you that are not so um, familiar with Ovesco clips, it's basically in principle very much as a varicel bander would be applied on the tip of your scope. It's got a string that goes through your channel and that you are able to shorten by turning a wheel on your, on your hand piece, exactly like... Uh, uh, bander except that the that the clip looks like a bear trap um it's phenomenally good at getting things together um, i have to say i'm not punting this uh, but it is really a good device for certain situations now the problem is once you've put it there how on earth do you get it off and that's the thing you now need to actually use bipolar fragmentation of that clip to get it off so when you do this be fully aware that you're putting it there for, for a good reason, but it's not going to move. Um, and then you have to get the rep to bring the device down from, it's usually sitting in Joburg. You have to bring it down and fragment that um, clip to actually get the stent out. So I'm going to show you the same patient now that I perforated. We brought her back um, three weeks later. You can see the scope now. I hope you can see the little clip there in the distance. The, the image is a bit tricky because of the cap that's on there, but there's the bipolar fragmentation device. You have to apply it um, and you'll see a bit of spark. There you go. You apply it to the thinnest parts of the, of the clip. You have to do it bilaterally to get it loose. It didn't look like it's actually getting there. Try again on the other side. And now as I pull the device back, you can see that there's a bit of a fracture visible, hopefully, I hope you can see it on the front aspect of the clip. There you can see it. Now we go back and we do the other side again. And then you can see once that's clipped, that fracture um, actually causes the whole thing to break in half. Quite sharp, those edges. So if possible, you should try and catch it um, into your device and pull it out. Um, duodenal stents like esophageal stents have a wire, uh, a wire, a string that you can pull to de to narrow off the um, proximal aspect so that you can pull it out comfortably. Um, and that's then what we did in this case. And the uh, yeah, perforation had fortunately healed up, but um, I've subsequently remembered to have respect for a D1 stricture in comparison to a pyloric stricture. Here's an image of, as I promised you earlier, of a lady that we popped in a stent. And you can see it's beautifully positioned. She is in the middle of it. You've got a lot of, um, it's not a lot, but you've got enough adequate stent um, hanging out into the antrum. But you can see that there's absolutely no expansion of that stent over the area of the stricture. And this unfortunate lady was one of our gall gallbladder cancers. So, um, yeah, so what do you do now? Um, we've, I've tried it all. We've tried putting balloons down, dilating that thing. We've tried putting a second stent in there. Um, from here, you can see that it's almost impossible to get a second stent device through that stricture. It's so tight. Um, it doesn't work. If your stent doesn't open, your first stent doesn't open, popping in a second one is not going to work. 
Um, so this patient is someone you have to accept technically not a success. Um, or well, technically a success is in the right place, but it's not a clinical translation of success. So you would have to then consider something else. And your options are then either, either a surgical um, gastrojejunostomy or if you have the capability and knowledge in your unit, you can do an endoscopic ultrasound guided gastro um, enterostomy um, with the lumen opposing stent. And there are very good reports as regards the outcomes because the stent positioning is away from the tumor. So um, the outcomes long-term are a bit better than those where you put the stent directly into the obstruction of where the tumor is sitting. Um, I'm going to be very honest. I've never done this. Um, we haven't tried this in our unit. And there's various ways to do so. Um, I think... Yeah, it's, it's something to know about. And if you've got access to this service, fantastic. In our setup, um, we'd probably just go and do a, a surgical, obviously, if the patients fit a surgical bypass. Hopefully laparoscopic, at least minimize the incision. And then finally, um, my last slide, when don't you stent? So this is a picture, a, a video of someone quite obviously with a mid gastric stricturing um, and you can hopefully appreciate that proximally to this there's quite a stiffness of the wall there's no rugae really visible and you can see a bit of pooling of fluid above that um, but when you pass distally you can actually get past quite easily with your scope um, and then you almost end up in a yeah, comparatively normal looking antrum and this patient has a proximal and mid um, body linitis plastica type of diffuse gastric CA infiltration. You can see there, there's very little distensibility with insufflation proximally at the moment. Um, and despite the fact that you can see there's a stricture, you're wasting your time putting a stent in here. Your, your stomach wall cannot contract um, and there will be very little success. You're just going to waste uh, the six to 8,000 rand that your stent costs. Um, so linitis plastica, yeah, we do sometimes um, stent them distally, you know, if it's a pyloric antral stricture. Um, in that, you sort of get some drainage of fluid, uh, helps the nausea and the regurgitation a bit, but, you know, it doesn't really do much. So that, this is a really nasty situation to be in, and I, I'm not convinced are you justified in stenting these patients. Um, yeah, I think... I think that's all I really have to say. That's kind of a practical approach to things. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any, but that's yeah, my take on yeah, stenting someone from a practical point of view. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kalia. Uh, that really was a, a journey through all, all eventualities with, with uh, Judy no stenting. Um, I wonder if there's any questions from, from the audience, if you want to put your hand up or, or otherwise, um, please do that. In the, in the meantime, um, you, you just briefly mentioned it, but there was a prior series, I think published by John Shaw regarding um, judinal stenting pre predominantly in CA head of pancreas. And their average survival was forty-four days. Is your do you think that that's that's where we sit just now, or can you predict survival with your performance status? No, I, I, I honestly can't. The problem at the moment is that we don't have a very good follow-up of our patients that we stent in, and they often come from peripheries and go back. So they come just for their intervention. So how long they all survive, I can't actually tell you, to be very honest. Your performance status, there's enough evidence. And you all know um, when you see someone, you're like, oh, am I doing anything here? But I do think, um, I, I still think, you know, if you, if you give someone two or three weeks, you're not going to improve them nutritionally. But if you just drain the stomach and stop the vomiting, which is, so exhausting and that perpetual feeling of nausea 
I, I, I would still stent if they were able to tolerate um, the procedure. So I'm quite liberal with who I stent, despite full well knowing that the performance status is a very good predictor of outcome. Um, but I, um, yeah, I do stent quite liberally. And what's, what's your view on, on um, nutritional support in most of these patients? Do you feel, do you actually pass a nasoenteral tube afterwards? Or do you mainly focus on that before the procedure? Um, so I think you have to have either a performance status that precludes completely to any kind of surgical intervention. But if this is a patient that we think is resectable from a gastric cancer point of view, or if it's a benign obstruction, that's definitely you can do something about it. Um, yes, we do feed simultaneously. So in that case, um, if we think it's resectable, I would actually first try and avoid putting a stent and we just put down a nasogestional tube and fatten them up that way. So I don't often use a stent as a nutritional improvement device, if I can put it that way. So if we've got someone with a goo that we think is resectable, we'll put down simultaneously a nasojeg and a nasogastric tube, admit them, um, feed them at least for 10 days to two weeks, and then resect them. I don't use a stent routinely for that situation. It's different if I've made a perforation. Um, there, I would put the stent down first to seal it, put the Ovesco on to keep it in place. And then finally, third step is to put down the um, jag wire through the stent and a nasogestional feeding tube over that. Um, yeah, whether that's overkill or you should just let your patient eat, I don't know. We tend to do a contrast swallow within 48 hours and see if that's, that leak is completely healed um, before letting them take anything orally. I, I suppose you can debate whether that's necessary. There's a, there's a question here in the chat box about uh, benign duodenal strictures. Um, do you, and it sounds obviously like he's a, he's a surgeon because it says, do you think it's better just to refer the patient for surgical intervention rather than attempt stenting if you've got a benign stricture of so, thanks bright that's a good question i would do neither i would consider this patient very strongly for an endoscopic balloon dilatation um, there's very good results in most series with that um, and you should offer that patient a repeated dilatation within a specified time frame don't just dilate them once and never see them again Simultaneously, you have to sort out what is the actual cause of your stricture. So if it's, a, if it's pil pil um, peptic ulcer disease, there's very little point in treating with PPIs if you're not going to check for, for H. pylori. So completely investigate the patient. Definitely worthwhile entering them into a um, dilatation program. The, we've looked at our benign strictures, um, gastric outlet strict, um, obstructions, um, and we get away with about half of the patients um, having a, a, a clinical success with endoscopic dilatations. And as you'll know, most of the patients, not all, but most of the patients that present with benign strictures have a complicated peptic ulcer history, abdomen, been there before, had a perforation. If you can avoid surgery there, gosh, by all means do. Um, if you look at the international figures, they've got much higher success rates than our 50%, um, and they avoid surgery in, in most cases. So, yeah, I still think if we're getting away with half of our patients avoiding surgery, I still think that's quite, quite a good number. So we always dilate. I would not stent um, unless there's a, there's a reason that I want to seal something off. Um, but otherwise we dilate and if it's a really tight stricture dilate put a feeding tube and redilate in a week keep the patient in um, and it's quite an active dilatation program initially and can be quite quite time consuming but it's definitely worthwhile i couldn't agree more you want to try and avoid surgery for peptic ulcer disease even if it's burnt out disease um, and and until you've really Tricky exhausted food, um, yeah. Um, when, one last question. I haven't actually seen this device. It's called a helical TAC system for the management of iatrogenic duodenal perforations. Obviously, occasionally we do perforate with EUS and with uh, ERCP. And mm. um, 
generally speaking, if that's that's usually in the situation where they have some form of duodenal obstruction and people have been trying too hard. So have you any experience with this helical tax system? And, no, um, I don't. Um, perhaps Dominic can explain what it is. I've, I've not seen that. Sorry, no. Dominic, do you want, want to explain to what it is? Unmask yourself and tell us. Please introduce yourself, Dominic. Are you unmuted? You must unmute, Dominic. Okay, let's answer the other. Oh, yes, Go ahead. Yeah, 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 my name is Dr. Mutura. I'm a fellow in medical GIT. So uh, I just came across uh, this. Uh, there's a particular particular article. Sorry, sorry. The name of the Yes. You'd probably be quicker to go into our office and ask her okay. directly. Can you hear me clearly? Sorry. Yes, carry on. Okay, uh, so I, I came across an article where they were talking about uh, an iatrogenic duodenal perforation. So uh, they have the contact system where you have, uh, it's, it's, it's a device which deploys uh, about four tacks. So four tacks are like, it's a needle which has a suture onto the, the lesion. Then um, after anchoring on like four different points, the suture, you're able to make like a pass string and you're able to pull and uh, you deploy like a, a pin which anchors the, the pass string suture, then that closes the perforation. It's called a helical tax system. It's something which I saw in one of those articles by the video GIE. Mm. So I don't know, have, have, you, have you gotten the explanation? I hope I've, I was clear. I, I, I do think I understand what you're talking about, but no, I've got zero, zero experience with that. I've, oh, okay. I, I don't know the name of it, but I've seen videos of it as well. It's quite cool, um, but no, zero experience from my side. I don't, I don't okay. even know if you can get them here. We'll have to find out from some of the reps. Um, okay. Thanks, Dominic. There's one more question. Uh, for the same patient with a D1 stricture that I perforated, would you consider inserting a nasal jedge after applying hemoclips to, on the perforation? Um, you can definitely close a perforation if you can see it. And you can use a couple of hemoclips. You can use an Ovesco. Um, sounds like you can use this helical tax system, whatever. But the, the point is you have to see it um, and get to it and really be able to make sure that you're approximating both ends of your mucosal tear, wherever it may be. In this situation where we stented it, um, I couldn't actually even see where I'd made the perforation because it was within or just behind the actual stricture. Um, I just knew there was a perforation because of all, of the, all of the retroperitoneal gas. So, yeah, by all means, if you can see it, close it, um, for sure, that's better than a stent. Um, but, but yeah, no, yeah. Can I say, I, th I think, again, for benign disease, if you're likely to rupture it and stretch it and create the perforation at the site of the stricture, it's, it's, I, I would say you want to, even if you can see the perforation, the clips are really not good for, for approximating fibrotic tissue. You're much better to try an Ovesco if you, if you can see it uh, clearly. And I think, again, if you have a duodenal perforation on the outside of the C, then that's amenable to, to that because usually it's at the site of non-pathological tissue. So I would avoid using slim clips um, for, for uh, perforations through pathological tissue, even if you can see them. They're, they're going to cut through or they're just not going to approximate it. And if you have any chance, I would probably say it's with the, the um, Avesco. I know, Galia, that the Avesco comes in now different kinds of jaws. Which, which, which jaws, are there jaws for different purposes? Yeah, apparently we've only got the one type, works for everything. So I don't know if that's just a way to make a bit more money. Um, yes. No, no, I think, I think some people are using sort of curved jaws for obviously soft tissue for notes and other things. There's but... a, yeah, there's a, I mean, sorry, just to go back to the previous thing, I agree with um, Prof there. I think that they tear through and closing a perforation that's fresh, that works. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay, back to the Ovesco. 
there's a there's a special of vesco which they call the um, stent what do they call it stent um migration device of vesco clip something long like that it, it, it's slightly rounded at the edges i'm honestly not sure how that's any different yeah. to the normal vesco so i'm sure it's much more expensive uh, but yeah i don't know we just use the plain old one it works well for everything yes um I think that's been some very interesting discussion, and um, I, I would just like to take this opportunity to um, thank um, thank Galia for putting it all together. I knew mean, there's a lot of effort there collecting these cases and giving us the practical tips that that are really um, applicable to to day to day practice when you get into these problems. It's good to have someone who's thought them through before you, so that you don't fall into the same same mistakes. So um, I would, again, uh, like to remind you that we thank the ECHO teams, both in India and in New Mexico, that this is recorded and available on the Gastro Foundation website. And thanks to Galia for presenting, and thanks to our sponsor. And next week, I believe, is pediatric gastroenterology. So for all the little ones, uh, next week is for you. So thanks again. and. Um, uh, I think we can now declare the meeting closed. Thanks very much. Thanks, Galia. Thanks, Sandy. Bye. Bye.